Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our third orthopedic anatomy event. I'm Matt Olin, co-founder of Charlotte is Creative and host for Creative Morning Charlotte. And I'll be your host today alongside Rachel. And I'm Rachel Klaus, academic program specialist and resident anatomist at Experience Anatomy. So if you're tuning into this event series for the first time, we'll give you a little background. At Ortho Carolina, their goal in 2020 was to create a series of events to educate you on your anatomy and explain what actually happens to your muscles, bones, and joints when you're in pain. We set out to highlight a variety of orthopedic topics so you can get all of your questions answered by our team of doctors alongside the experts at Experience Anatomy. For those of you who don't know Experience Anatomy, we are a premier anatomy education company specializing in training and education using real preserved human specimens. We are fully outfitted with a cadaver lab and human models, which allow you to see what your muscles and bones look like under your skin. Here's a quick look at what we do. Welcome to Experience Anatomy, where we're dedicated to providing the highest quality anatomical specimens for all levels of training. This is our classroom and conference center designed for intimate learning, virtual sessions, and larger panel discussions. This is our multifunctional lab space, fully equipped as a mock OR, where we host cadaveric dissection and surgical training. Our lab is the ideal setting for educators, researchers, medical professionals, first responders, and military personnel to develop and hone their skills. We are committed to facilitating cadaveric tissue study using a proprietary soft embalming technique in a rich, authentic, and convenient learning environment. Experience Anatomy, where education meets application. Now with the recent changes in our world, this program has been adjusted to be a completely virtual experience, so you can tune in where it's convenient for you. The entire video will be av available after the event, so you, if you miss something, you can watch it back later and share it with a friend if you find the information helpful. Now, today we'll be discussing ailments of the spine. We'll touch on spinal stenosis, scoliosis, spinal decompression or fusion, and disc replacements and injections. We'll discuss what that means when it comes to your care and what your appointment and potential treatment can actually look like. And if we have any time left over, we'll bring my wife in to discuss why I didn't have time or the spine to talk to the car salesman down further in price last weekend. <laughs> <laughs> this is a virtual event streaming live on Facebook and YouTube. So this is your opportunity to ask our spine doctors anything. We've got a panel of physicians ready to answer your questions at the end. If you already know what you want to ask, comment in our live stream below on whichever platform you're watching and we'll be sure to discuss. Now let's meet our panelists. Hi all, thanks for joining us today. Why don't you all introduce yourselves uh, here so we can get to know you. Uh, where you typically see patients, and any other information that you'd like to share about yourselves. And let's start with uh, Dr. Chastness. Event. Um, thank you also, everybody, for turning in. Um, my name is Alex Chastness, and I'm an interventional physiatrist at Ortho Carolina. Um, I basically do a lot of different um, spinal injections as well as other different kinds of injections to try to alleviate pain. And um, I work mainly out of our Huntersville office, but also work out of our Concord office as well as um, our Mooresville office. Hi, this is uh, Tony Kwan. I'm one of the orthopedic spine surgeons uh, at the Ortho Carolina Spine Center, uh, primarily seeing patients at our uptown location on Randolph Road, as well as in Pineville. Um, but basically, I've been in practice for about 16 years now and uh, do primarily spinal deformity surgery, um, as well as minimally invasive spine surgery. So 
uh, certainly some some things we can address tonight. But uh, lucky to have a lot of uh, world class colleagues uh, that you'll hear from tonight. From our panelist, Dr. McGee. Uh, hi, I'm Michael McGee. I'm one of the interventional physiatrists at our Hickory location. I also go to the Boone location. Um, so yeah, I, as Dr. Chasness was saying, we kind of focus on injections, therapies, medications, non-surgical type treatments. Thank you so much, Dr. McGee. Uh, lo would love to hear from Dr. Pulaski now. Yes, uh, good evening. Thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Michael Pulaski. I'm one of the pediatric orthopedic surgeons at the Ortho Carolina Pediatric uh, Center, and I uh, specialize in uh, spinal deformity surgery for pediatrics and adolescent uh, kids here in Charlotte. Uh, practice mainly at our uh, main pediatric center in Charlotte, but also go to our Huntersville and uh, university locations. Fantastic. Thank you so much. And last but not least, let's meet Dr. Wegner. Hi, thank you for having me. My name is Adam Wegner. Um, I just finished my fellowship in uh, pediatric and adult spine surgery at Washington University in St. Louis and just started at the uh, Ortho Carolina Winston-Salem Spine Center in October. Um, I do a wide range of spine surgery from pediatric to adult and from degenerative to deformity. So I've trained in everything and enjoy doing all types of spine surgery. So I'm looking forward to discussing those tonight. Thank you so much to all of you. We're so glad to have you here. All right, so now that we've met our panelists for tonight, if you have a question, please comment on the live stream below and we'll tackle those at the end. Now let's take a look at our first segment with Dr. Chastness as he touches on back pain and what your next steps might be moving forward when consulting an orthopedic specialist. Hello, I'm Dr. Alex Chasnis, and I'm a physiatrist at Ortho Carolina working out of our Huntersville office. I get the question a lot about what is a physiatrist? Is it a podiatrist? Is it a pediatrician? Is it a psychologist or any of those medical specialties that deal with P? Physiatry is the branch of medicine that deals with improving patients' function and quality of life in patients who have various impairments or disabilities. The Ortho Carolina physiatrists have specialized within the area of spine medicine, specifically non-operative spine medicine. The part that makes us unique is the skill of being able to inject different potential pain generators in the spine. Just like a surgeon, a spine surgeon, will use his scalpel as the unique part of his practice, we will use the needle. So we get a lot of questions regarding injections. How do they work? Is it a band-aid? Is it some kind of temporary fix? Is it just masking something? And I think it's important to have a further in-depth discussion on this topic to kind of really understand how injections work. For starters, injections don't change the structure of the spine. It is a strong anti-inflammatory. It's typically a corticosteroid or cortisone type injection that we use. Injection treatments really depend on the ability to isolate a specific pain generator that we think might be causing somebody's symptoms. If we can identify a specific nerve or a few isolated joints that we think could be causing the pain, then we may try injection treatments. And these injections are usually done under fluoroscopic guidance, very similar to any other injection, but the main difference is that we do it under an x-ray so we can see and be accurate and place the medication directly as close to the pain generator as we can. And a good way to think of this is that we're trying to treat this problem chemically by reducing inflammation and take away pain in that manner, as opposed to treating something surgically which involves physically going in and changing the structure of the spine. So there's two major structures that we commonly target with injections, either a nerve that is getting pinched, or secondly, an arthritic structure if we can identify a specific structure to target with an injection treatment. There are two places where nerves tend to get pinched. The first is the side hole where the nerve comes out, and the other, is right down the middle of the spinal canal where I place this pen. This is our spinal cord, this gray structure. The spinal cord actually ends at this point and then it gives off all these little nerves that run up and down through the spinal canal. You can see as we track down to this area through here, the spinal canal is narrowed. We call that stenosis. 
and then once we get through those two areas of narrowing, it opens back up again. The other kind of common injection that we do on the spine to target arthritis relates to these joints where the bones actually clip together. So you can see on the front of the spine, the bones tend to be separated by a disc, and then on the back of the spine, those bones actually clip together at these small little joints. Many times these small little joints become arthritic and painful, and if we can isolate which joint we think it is, we will target that specific joint. So what are the type of things that patients consider when they're trying to determine if they want to move forward with an injection? First of all, some of these patients have already been through more conservative treatment like physical therapy medications and just haven't had the response that they were hoping for. Sometimes physical therapy is a time commitment and people don't have the time to attend physical therapy regularly, maybe due to job purposes or taking care of children. And then thirdly, sometimes physical therapy can actually aggravate or cause some discomfort. And finally, there may be patients who actually have a surgical problem and want surgery, but due to medical comorbidities, can't have surgery. And that makes the injections really the strongest treatment option they have to help manage their symptoms. The types of injections that we do in the spine typically can be performed on anybody of any age. It's relatively uncommon to have young people, including teenagers, to have spinal pain, but we do see young teenagers with disc herniations sometimes, and they do prefer to move forward with an injection as opposed to having surgery at such a young age. Also, there is no upper age limit on who can have an injection. At times, elderly people tend to have some cardiac or vascular issues and may end up on blood thinners, and the only requirement is that we do like to have them off blood thinners before we stick needles in their spinal area. Patients never need an injection. It is completely elective depending on whether they want to try it and whether it helps them. How often can they get injections? There are some rough guidelines that have been put forth by spine societies and organizations that try to guide us with that. Their recommendations suggest three injections in about a six month time frame or four injections in a year. But most importantly, I just tell patients we're gonna use good judgment. And if something tends to provide very good, beneficial, relatively long lasting relief, I'm okay with repeating it every so often particularly in patients who may not have other treatment options available. So what can a patient expect when they have an injection? Patients typically will walk in for the procedure and they walk out within a 10 to 15 minutes of the procedure. Their only restriction is usually to avoid driving for the first couple hours until the lidocaine anesthetic has worn off the nerves that control the leg. Usually the majority of patients that I see for injections tend to tell me that the worst part of their injection was either the anxiety before the injection, or possibly the lidocaine to get everything numbed up. As with any injection, at times an injection may not be beneficial and provide the amount or degree of relief that we want, in which case we may choose to inject a different area or abandon injection treatments altogether and try other treatment options. One last thing I want to mention when I hear patients talk about, is this just a Band-Aid or a temporary fix? They seem to be focused more on what a picture might show, or maybe somebody told them they had a bone spur, or possibly they read an MRI report that said they have a disc bulge. And they tend to focus more on what something looks like. And in reality, we don't treat pictures. We treat pain and we treat symptoms. If we treated structures, everybody would have an endless number of spine surgeries performed on their body from the neck to the low back over the course of their lifetime. And that's not reality. So in conclusion, if you're having spine pain that interferes with your quality of life and you're wondering whether there's something else that can be done, either surgical or non-surgical, make an appointment to either see me in our Huntersville or Mooresville office or even one of our Ortho Carolina providers. We now offer online scheduling. Wow, that really does show me that there is a solution out there for people that are having discomfort, having issues, but they don't want to go through full-on surgery, probably don't need full-on surgery. I know my sister has actually um, experienced some of this too, and her experience has been really, really great. She's found relief from her back pain? She has, and I know when she first started experiencing her, her uh, symptoms, the fear was, oh, I'm going to have to go through um, full-on surgery and, and the recovery that goes with that. And then this became an option for her, and it's been a great option. 
Yeah, so it sounds like um, injections really can relieve some anxiety and tension that goes along with having to pursue back surgery and potentially can eliminate the need for back surgery altogether. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. Well, for those of you just joining us, you're watching Ortho Carolina's third orthopedic anatomy event presented with Experience Anatomy. So, Dr. McGeehee, I have a question for you. Are spine injections painful, and what can you do to prepare for them? Uh, yes, spine injections typically hurt. I mean, we use lidocaine to try to numb it up to some degree, but you are putting medicine on a nerve that typically is irritated or a joint that's irritated. You know, so that's that's part of what it's going to be. It's typically, is the injection going to be better than the pain you're suffering most of the time? If you're not having any pain, you don't need us. So as far as, you know, things you can do ahead of time, try to get a good night's rest, eat a little something the day of. We don't put people to sleep for the injection, so you don't have to not eat. We tell that to people who frequently don't eat anything and then already come in not feeling too great. So um, we talk our patients through it. That's a big thing, explaining, look, this is going to be a stick and a burn, kind of like the dentist's office. You numb it up, and then you feel pressure. But, yes, the injections hurt. You be honest with people and let them know that there is some pain associated with the injection, but the goal being that we're going to get your overall pain level down. Gotcha. Well, thank you, Dr. McGee. And just a reminder that uh, if you have a question out there for the panel, please add to the live stream chat below, and we'll tackle those at the end. Okay, now I'm going to toss it back over to Rachel in the anatomy corner for a hands-on demonstration before our next segment begins. So hello, welcome to the anatomy corner. Um, before we head over to our next segment, I'm going to show you just a little bit of an anatomy using our specimens here at Experience Anatomy. So I have a few vertebrae here. Vertebrae are the individual bones that make up the entire spinal column, and they are shaped kind of funny. There's the vertebral body, which is this round part here. It's the, the meat of the vertebrae. If you look at this specimen here and this specimen here, you can see where the vertebrae are, but we've cut them in half. So you're looking through the vertebral canal, which is this hole. And this hole is where the spinal cord resides. So if we see here, we see the spinal cord running along through the spinal canal within the vertebra vertebral column on this specimen. And over here we see the spinal cord running through the vertebral canal over here on this specimen. <clears throat> and so you can see how deformities in this vertebral canal, here are two vertebrae stacked on top of each other, could cause impingement on a nerve or disc bulging into the spinal canal, causing pressure on the spinal cord. And this can cause different symptoms depending on where this occurs. So if we look at a spinal cord, this is what the spinal cord looks at. This is the head end. This is the tail end. And the spinal cord itself runs all the way down and it ends, the cord itself actually ends at about the level of your belly button in your back. And then the contents of the spinal canal consists of spinal nerves, which run out to your legs. So depending on where you have impingement, if it's on these spinal nerves exiting the spinal canal or it's on the spinal cord itself, you might have different symptoms in your arm, in your thorax, or down in your leg. And here's an example of the nerves that branch out to travel down to your leg. The sciatic nerve is a big nerve that a lot of people have trouble with. You can see here. And this provides all the sensation and motor innervation um, down the length of your leg. So our next segment is uh, visualizing some anatomy using the anatomage table. Um, CPCC was kind enough to let us come in there and do some visualization of the spine. So let's go look at some virtual anatomy. Hi, this is Anthony Kwan. I'm one of the spine surgeons at Ortho Carolina, and I'm here today to talk to you about spinal disorders and spinal conditions. We're here at Central Piedmont Community College looking at the anatomage 
a 3D virtual anatomy table. This is an exciting opportunity to utilize both a virtual platform to talk about these conditions, as well as introduce you as a patient opportunities as far as uh, knowing us and our team and the conditions that we treat. So the first thing that we generally pay attention to is just the overall, what we call balance of the spine. So we generally like the head to be above the pelvis, to be above the feet. This is what we try to either recreate or balance um, as we're doing uh, types of different spinal surgery. So as we're looking at it from the side, these little red boxes are the vertebrae or the bones. These white cushions in between are considered the discs and essentially in the spine, they function as shock absorbers uh, for the back and for the vertebrae. So now that we've looked at what a normal spine is, I think it's helpful to kind of know why one of you might seek one of our opinions and evaluation. And the primary reason why someone would come to see us is pain. That's usually the, the top of the list as far as symptoms go. Um, and just because you hurt your back lifting a couch yesterday doesn't necessarily mean that you have to rush to see a spine surgeon, um, but certainly pain that's prolonged and not getting better with the usual means, anti-inflammatories, rest, ice, so forth, uh, would be a potential reason to come uh, see a spine specialist. Usually it starts off with a questionnaire or spine form that'll kind of go over a lot of the typical symptoms and conditions that we may be able to identify and treat, and that would be kind of step one. Uh, the second step is usually a physical exam, so we would have one of our providers um, examine your muscle strength, look at your spine, examine your reflexes, and your sensory exam to see if there are any changes that we can detect. Oftentimes, um, at this stage, we're maximizing our conservative care, so physical therapy, uh, short-term uh, anti-inflammatories, um, exercise programs. Um, these are some of the things that will institute uh, usually for kind of patients who have not had any formal treatment. Being a specialty center, we also see patients who have run the gamut of all these options and have done injections, have done therapy, uh, and are here kind of for that next level of care. Uh, and that often means surgery at this point. And really the goals of surgery are fairly simple. Um, it's really three things that we would operate on. Uh, one is nerve compression. So if you have a pinched nerve, the goal is to unpinch that nerve. Number two would be instability. If bones are out of place, the goal would be to stabilize that area. We call that a spinal fusion as far as potential surgery goes. The last would be deformity correction. And if we have a spine like this that is crooked and not in the right position, we often will utilize different surgical techniques to correct spinal deformity and make the spine straight. So at this point, what we'll do is actually look at real life examples of potential spinal pathologies and how they would present and how we would evaluate and treat these conditions. So this is a CT picture of a spine that has uh, a few problems. Uh, these little things over here are bone spurs or osteophytes. Uh, and these are indicative of degeneration and uh, wear and tear of that disc as well as the vertebrae. As you can see, uh, you may not be a surgeon, but you can certainly appreciate that the spine is, is crooked here. And this curvature is what we call scoliosis. If we're looking specifically at this disc, we can see that the disc up here is more higher than it is down here, and we get this asymmetric collapse of the disc. And not surprising if this side has less cushion, that's the side that we're gonna see the bone spurs or the osteophytes on. The nerves that are right back here can be affected by these bone spurs uh, and can cause further nerve compression uh, and pain symptoms associated with a pinched nerve. Uh, those mainly being pain down the leg, numbness down the leg, as well as potential weakness as well. So here we have bones that are actual human bones. So as the discs kind of wear down, uh, we have the foramen, which are these little holes, and that would correspond to this area on here uh, that the nerves exit out of. So as the disc wears down, we have a squeezing of that hole, and all of a sudden the space for that nerve becomes very narrow to the point where you can get nerve compression. So as far as treatment goes, we typically would start off with uh, physical therapy as well as anti-inflammatories mainly to get some of the inflammation down as well as get their back stronger and have our dedicated physical therapist to really work on the back. The goal is to increase mobility, strengthen the spine, strengthen the core so that it can take some of the pressure off the discs and support the spine better. 
And we often find that 90% of the time, that's all that patients need. Now, in those 10% of cases where patients may come back and they've been diligent with therapy, they've tried anti-inflammatories, oftentimes the next step would be injections. Usually these injections can provide uh, somewhat dramatic relief for patients, um, especially if they have areas of nerve compression and nerve inflammation. So we'll switch gears now to the neck, and this is a rendering of the most common surgery that we do in the cervical spine or the neck. So this is what's commonly referred to as a cervical fusion, and we often will identify the, the disc as a most likely culprit, but we also can see bone spurs or arthritic conditions that can cause compression of the spine as well as the nerves. So in this approach, it's actually a little bit unique in the sense that we go in from the front of the neck. We're not having to really cut muscle, cut bone to uh, do this type of surgery. So when we talk about surgery as we're going in from the front, we'll actually go in there and take out the herniated or ruptured disc and often place a spacer uh, to maintain the separation between the bones and to keep things uh, in place, we'll utilize a plate and screws to put up front uh, to stabilize the spine. This is the most common surgery that we do uh, and uh, often one of the most successful. Uh, just as a reference point, uh, this is the surgery that Peyton Manning had done and he was able to turn to professional football. Uh, and we have a lot of high level athletes as well as weekend warriors who can get back to full activity after these types of procedures. So this concludes our orthopedic anatomy series on the spine. I'd like to personally thank CPCC and our partners at Experience Anatomy for allowing us to utilize this amazing technology. If as a patient you have any of these symptoms or conditions or have concerns of any spinal disorders, feel free to reach out to us at OrthoCarolina or you can book directly at orthocarolina.com. Wow, that was pretty informational. So I guess it's worth noting that um, orthopedic spine surgeons are operating on the bones and the joints of the spine, and they're not touching the spinal cord or the nerves exiting the spine. I mean, that's what I'm finding so interesting about this is that we think of the super highway of your spine and everything that that, that uh, does in our body. I think people are very nervous about it, but <laughs> it's like, what's that? They're nervous about it. They are. Oh, good. <laughs> Very good. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, there, there are some misconceptions. It, it is on the bone, this, this work that you're talking about, not, not necessarily the actual spinal cord. Yeah, and they're, they're just opening that highway. They're expanding that highway so that the nervous pathways can flow and operate the way they're supposed to. Yeah, no doubt. Well, Dr. Wegner, here's a question for you. What are the known causes for spinal stenosis? And... Uh, can you prevent it? Uh, well, the most common cause of spinal stenosis is um, degeneration of the spine. So it's a combination of your genetics, um, how much bone you make when you have wear and tear on your spine, could potentially be from traumatic causes. Um, you know, and then there are other factors. You know, some people's spinal canals are naturally bigger and some are smaller, so there can they have more room in case there is, you know, there are bone spurs or disc bulges. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the main thing is, is, you know, bone spurs and arthritis and disc bulges that can press on the nerves. Gotcha. Gotcha. Thank you. Well, Dr. Pulaski, because you specialize in pediatrics, I'd like to ask you, um, how are spine care treatments different for children? And what, what do parents need to know when their child has, you know, back pain or a spine condition? Uh, you know, in kids, uh, a lot of the uh, etiologies of the pain are muscular in nature. Uh, luckily, they don't have degeneration or arthritis at the young age. So uh, a lot of times pain come from growth, uh, a recent growth spurt, also activity. We see a lot of activity-related uh, pain uh, in terms of sports uh, or under activity. So there are kids who are very active who can have a lot of uh, back pain and strain on their muscles. The kids who are underactive who have weaker muscles, weaker core um, as well can also have back pain. But you know, luckily, it's usually not structural uh, pain like we'll see in adults. And uh, it can be treated conservatively uh, with simple uh, at-home exercises, anti-inflammatories, uh, some uh, stretches as well, and uh, simple non-invasive uh, uh, modalities. 
Great. Thank you so much for that insight. Anything else you want to add in before we move on? Uh, normal in kids. A lot of people think that kids don't get back pain, and if they do, that it's abnormal. But uh, believe it or not, there there is a amount of pain that is normal, especially in active, growing uh, children and adolescents. But now, if it becomes pain that's every day or interfering with their activities uh, at home or in sports, then that's a reason to uh, uh, to get checked out. Well, thank you all so much. And if you're just now tuning in. Welcome to Ortho Carolina's third orthopedic anatomy event presented with Experience Anatomy. It's really cool to get a behind the scenes look at this amazing work. And folks, if you like this type of content, Ortho Carolina has live streamed a few smaller procedures before in the OR. And you can check those out on Ortho Carolina's Facebook page. Now, please do submit your questions below if you're watching live because right now we're going to move to our Ask a Doctor segment to get all your burning spine-related questions answered by our panel. Which makes me wonder, is burning spine an actual condition? I guess we'll find out if someone asks. What sort of questions do we have, Rachel? Yeah, so the first question is, if pain injections don't work, what are the remaining options available before considering surgery? Well, it, if injections don't seem to help, I mean, typically you've tried therapy before that if you can. Um, it, it, typically, kind of the treatment are therapies, injections, medications. If none of those things help and there is a surgical indication, then, then usually surgery. So there's not necessarily a lot of options. If you failed therapies, you failed injections, at that point it's probably time to at least talk to a surgeon see if that's a viable option. Yeah, this is uh, Tony Quanso. I mean, I think surgery should certainly be the, the last option for most people, but uh, usually a lot of times the patients that I see have already seen doctors like our physiatrists who practice non-operative medicine. So uh, oftentimes if you hurt your back, uh, most people get better. So um, just because you twisted your back a few days ago doesn't automatically mean that you need surgery. Uh, a lot of times we'll recommend the typical treatments such as anti-inflammatories, rest, activity modification. Uh, if that doesn't work, oftentimes we've escalated to advanced imaging such as MRIs, CAT scans, which then may lead to injections. Um, but if that doesn't work, then I think that's when we start to entertain surgery, but oftentimes that can be months down the road. Um, obviously there are conditions that if there are neurologic issues, weakness in the leg, the feet, walking, gait imbalances that indicate a more serious problem, uh, that might make that referral a little bit more urgent, but certainly from a pain perspective, uh, most patients are able to be managed without surgery. Great, thank you for that. Uh, this question is for Dr. McGehee or Dr. Chastnis. Uh, are there any conditions that could prevent a patient from utilizing spinal injections? I think there are very few things that prevent us from attempting an injection. I think a lot of times the bigger question is, are we really dealing with something or seeing um, something that's going to respond favorably to an injection? Um, but as far as, you know, are there things that preclude us from trying an injection? There's very few things. I think the biggest thing is if somebody is on um, a blood thinner, particularly a heavy duty blood thinner, um, that's usually a situation that we don't want to be sticking a needle in the spinal area just in case um, it does cause some bleeding and uh, a hematoma down in the spinal area. That's the last place you want to bleed. Um, it's really not like you just bleed on your skin and you wipe it off. There's really no place for that blood to go and it accumulates and it can start to pinch on things like the spinal cord or other nerves and potentially cause catastrophic um, neurologic damage. So outside of that one situation, um, I'd say uh, we can attempt injections in most situations, assuming we see something in a problem that eject injections are typically amenable uh, to fixing. Great, thank you. Um, this question's for Dr. Wegner. Um, what are some misconceptions of spinal surgery? Um, well, I mean, I, I think a, a lot of patients come in and they think that any kind of back pain can be fixed by a surgery. 
Um, and oftentimes they're not willing to try anything else. They think, I just want a surgery. I don't want a Band-Aid. I don't want an injection. I don't want anything else. And, you know, I, I think that pe people need to realize that it's, it's sort of the last resort. Um, you know, like we've talked about, you know, it, I wouldn't want a spine surgery until I would have tried all those other things because 90, 99% of people who have back pain can get better without surgery. And, and back surgery definitely does have risk. It's not like you have a surgery and your pain will go away and then there's just, there's nothing else to worry about. So, um, you know, we definitely want people to go through physical therapy, injections, and all those other things we talk about before we even discuss surgery. Yeah, and I'll say the other side of the coin is, you know, if you listen to, uh, you know, Steve Kerr, the, the coach of the Golden State Warriors, who, you know, famously, famously said, never have spine surgery, uh, if at all possible. Um, I think there's also the converse where, um, you know, especially with spinal fusions, people hear the word spinal fusion, and they know a, an uncle's friend or neighbor's brother who had spine fusion, and you know, is, is worse off. And, and, and there is definitely uh, a sometimes negative connotation uh, to that. But um, I will say for patients who have unstable spines, uh, stabilizing them can be, you know, some of the most rewarding outcomes that you can have as a surgeon. So um, I think kind of the fear other way is also a little bit of a misconception. Wonderful. Thank you for those answers. Uh, another question for Drs. McGee and Chastney what is the best non-invasive treatment for severe nerve pain in the hip and down the back of the leg that's likely caused by degenerative discs at the base of the spine? So, well, I would, go, go ahead, ahead. Michael. Uh, so as far as um, treatment options, I mean, typically if the patient's able to do it, you try to get them into a lumbar stabilization program. So that's working on like the core muscles around that area, trying to get pressure off of that. Because when you're up and you're moving around, the spine is weight bearing. So you're trying to get pressure off of that. And the more you can build up your core, the more pressure you can get off. Now you can do injections and things like that for some pain control, but injections are a means to an end. So if you're just doing injections and you're not trying to get any other pressure off of the spine, you're really kind of doing your patient a disservice because you're not going to get them better long-term. Great. Thank you so much. And uh, just a reminder, we're actually answering listener uh, submitted questions right now to our panel of doctors, and Rachel has another one. Yes, so um, does a patient need an MRI before injection, or would a physical exam and x-ray be sufficient to, de to determine the location and cause of pain? Um, Dr. McGeehy or Chastness? Um. I would say that typically, if we're going to be doing interventional procedures in the spine, we would prefer to have an MRI. Uh, to be very honest with you, many patients come in and based on their physical exam findings, their history, and things we see on an MRI, we, we probably have a pretty good idea of where the, the pain is coming from. Um, you know, in certain situations, I may recognize uh, pretty quickly that this patient is dealing with a, a lower disc herniation in his back and it's causing pain that goes down his, uh, the back of the leg, and I might see some reflex changes, and I know exactly what's going on. Um, and for the sake of trying to provide somebody some therapeutic relief, instead of waiting a while to get an MRI approved and see him back and go over results, um, occasionally there are instances where we might just kind of speed that process up and jump to an injection. But I'd say as a whole, we do like to have the, uh, the MRI in general before we do an interventional procedures. Yeah, Thank I, you for that answer. Yeah, go ahead, please. I, I would agree. I mean, the, the x-rays can be helpful for certain things because you can do them weight-bearing, whereas in MRI, you're not necessarily weight-bearing, so you can see certain movements in the x-rays, but you can't see nerves and you can't see the actual discs themselves on x-rays. So to be able to see all of that and have a better picture of what all is going on, like Dr. Chassis was saying, we'd really prefer to have an MRI if possible. Great. Thank you for that information. And uh, what's trending over here are conservative treatment questions. Uh, but uh, as we go through these submitted questions, we, of course, uh, welcome any of the doctors, including the surgeons, to uh, chime in with some uh, insights. Now, this next question is for our surgeons. And the question is, how does someone prepare for spinal surgery? 
Yeah, I think that's a, a really interesting question. I mean, there's usually a lot of anxiety surrounding a spine surgery, and I think that's actually normal. Um, you know, working around the spinal cord, working around the nerves is a big deal. So I think making sure you have all of your questions answered, write down your questions before you go to the doctor, because inevitably you're going to forget them when you get there. Um, ask if they have any information booklets or recommended websites to, to look things up and make sure that you really understand what the surgeon is doing before you go into the operating room to, to sort of quell that anxiety and allow you to ask all the questions you need to answer. Okay, certainly that would help ease some anxiety walking into spine surgery. Um, another question about spine surgery is, what does the rehabilitation process look like? And is there any special equipment needed post-op, like a back brace or anything else? Um, I think it depends on the procedure. So uh, certain disc procedures like a microdiscectomy, uh, there may be just a period of letting your body recover, which for me is about two to four weeks and then starting physical therapy. Uh, other patients who have big spinal deformity surgeries uh, often need uh, rehabilitation or in-home therapy just to get them mobilizing and walking. And then that kind of leads to more uh, strengthening and conditioning afterwards. So um, as far as special equipment, other than a nice pair of shoes, I think that's about it. Um, but as far as uh, what we advocate initially is really uh, walking as much as possible um, after surgery. Great, thank you so much. Uh, this is more of a general question. What is stenosis in the soft tissue? And that's for anyone who wants to answer that question. I'm not really sure what that question means. Um, you know, stenosis is a word that we throw around a lot and most people don't really know what it means, but it really just means narrowing. Um, so generally we think of that narrowing being within the spinal canal um, I'm not really sure what they mean by in the soft tissues. Maybe someone else knows what that is. Anyone? Anyone? Yeah, I don't think any of us know exactly what that question is supposed to mean. Um, stenosis usually is, is on a canal um, or an area uh, where there's not supposed to be narrowing and it allows the nerve to pass through. So I don't, don't really know what the, what the question referring to stenosis in the soft tissue means. You can have it in blood levels and things like that, but yeah, I'm not sure what soft tissue means. All right, potentially it's just a misunderstanding of what stenosis actually is. Thanks for clarifying. Um, what do spinal injections actually consist of? Um, I know you mentioned there was an anti-inflammatory, is there cortisone or what, what makes up an injection? So it's a combination typically of a corticosteroid. So you're trying to decrease inflammation, that medication. And then we also typically will use lidocaine as well, both on the skin. And then when we put it on the nerve or the joint as well, uh, sometimes we'll use a longer acting numbing medication, depending on what we're trying to find out. So some injections, we actually want people to move around and try to do things afterwards. So we can kind of pin down that that's their pain generator. Um, so sometimes the steroid is, is, almost always part of it, but the numbing medication can be a big component as well. Great, thank you for that answer. Uh, another question for our surgical team here. Will patients need a back brace after surgery, and how long would a brace need to be worn? Um, typically, I, I don't usually brace my patients after surgery um, unless they're our traumatic conditions, um, but usually uh, we try to avoid bracing uh, if possible in most post-surgery patients. Uh, we often find that it just weakens their muscles and uh, patients get reliant on them. So uh, it also kind of hinders mobilization. So unless someone has osteoporosis, uh, a fracture that's unstable, or there is a specific reason to utilize uh, brace immobilization, uh, we typically do not brace our patients. Patients and adolescent patients after surgery typically don't need a brace, and sometimes that can be uh, uh, exciting for them to go through surgery uh, and get rid of their brace that they've had for a few years. Wonderful. 
Thank you. Um, this can come from any doctor, but what types of home stretching helps relieve back pain and or reduce the need for surgery or injections? The, the ones you do regularly. I mean, that it, that it's, it's just getting people into a regular routine. So there's no magic stretch or anything like that. It's core muscle work, yoga type exercises, but if you don't do it regularly, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter which exercise you're doing. Okay, thank you. Uh, this next question comes from a patient who actually has a lot of lower back pain at night, especially when turning over. Uh, they've seen a chiropractor and uh, worked on core strengthening techniques, but the pain does persist. Would they benefit from cortisone injections and physical therapy? I think there's probably some more information that we need to, to know there. Um, uh, back pain at night can be from a lot of different things. Um, uh, I think to, to start out the conversation, you always want to make sure that nighttime pain isn't something more ominous like, a, like tumor pain. Um, that's not that common, um, but it does exist and probably needs to be ruled out. Um, other than that, when people come in and they tell me that they have nighttime pain, a lot of times I ask them what, what mattress, what kind of mattress they have and how old it is. Uh, as a general rule, and this is not 100%, but as a general rule, most patients with back pain, especially nighttime pain, uh, they do prefer more of a firm mattress as opposed to a soft mattress. Uh, while a soft mattress might feel really good initially when you lay on it, there is a little bit of a lack of support that might catch up with you over laying in that, uh, over on that mattress for a couple hours. Um, and uh, sometimes uh, that is just kind of muscular strain as well. So uh, hard to know. Uh, just from that question, whether injections might benefit, um, it'd be worthwhile to maybe see that patient in the office and make that assessment. And uh, you know, if we do think it's soft tissue, it might even be worthwhile to just try a soft tissue injection, not necessarily a spinal injection. That's some good suggestions there. I have a firm mattress myself. I'd recommend it. Um, <laughs> so I wanted to ask Dr. Pulowski, what is the typical patient you see in PEDS or the most common type of patient you see? Uh, most common type of patient uh, I see are, uh, like I said, the kids that are very active. Uh, yeah, this, uh, in this day and age, well, minus COVID, uh, but uh, when we're outside of COVID, you know, sports run year round. It's a higher intensity of sports uh, that we see now that uh, we haven't seen uh, in the past, kind of when we were growing up. You, know, you add that, that high activity level, uh, plus really heavy book bags that we see in kids these days. Um, and that's, that's typically, you know, the most common uh, back and back pain patient I see uh, in terms of uh, uh, the actual spine itself. You know, uh, adolescent scoliosis is probably the most common uh, spinal deformity that I see in the office. Uh, which is you know, scoliosis being an abnormal curving of the spine or an increased curving of the spine. Uh, and that happens and occurs in about one to two out of a hundred kids. So it's uh, fairly common, uh, more common than uh, some parents might think. And you know, kids are diagnosed with it and they ask around their friends. Uh, they're surprised about how many kids actually do have uh, some sort of curve in their back that comes around uh, right around puberty. Interesting. Um do you do injections on pediatric patients? Uh, typically, we don't. Uh, you know, as, as I said before, their pain usually is muscular in nature. Uh, if there is a um, more of a pinched nerve type aspect in a little older patient, an older teenager, then uh, we will uh, entertain the idea of uh, injections. But typically, we try and avoid uh, steroids and corticosteroid injections uh, in uh, younger kids and uh, teenage population. And most of their pain, like uh, stated before, can be resolved usually with, uh, with some PT, some activity modifications, book bag modifications, uh, and plain old ibuprofen. Gotcha, thank you for that. Uh, lots of interest in injection treatments, and here's another question related to that. Would an injection be given for arthritis in the neck if there is not a pinched nerve involved? So we do occasionally um, do injections for more pain just in the neck without the, the pinched nerve pain. Um, 
to be honest with you, injections definitely tend to work better uh, for that kind of nerve irritation and, and radiating symptoms that go down in extremity. Uh, simply targeting injections in the, the neck uh, for arthritis um, can be difficult for a couple of reasons. One, there very rarely is an isolated joint that's involved. Um, there's so many joints in a small uh, geographic area in the spine, it's hard to know exactly which one is, is causing the pain, particularly because it tends to be arthritis changes in multiple joints at one time, not just uh, one joint. Uh, I definitely uh, tend to have better results when I can isolate just one or two joints to target instead of a, a really broad-based, diffuse, um, degenerative uh, kind of condition. Great, thank you. Um, so I just had an interesting question submitted for Dr. Kwan or Dr. Wegner. Um, do you recommend breast reductions to help alleviate back pain? Um, I guess I can answer this. I've had a few patients uh, undergo that route. Um, you know, I don't know that there is a uh, answer that can wholeheartedly uh, definitively say, yes, you should have one or should not. Um, I think that uh, there's a lot of factors involved. So certainly I would start off with therapy, and exercise and those types of things. Um, but I don't know that as spine surgeons that we could necessarily um, say that a breast reduction will re uh, result in a reduction of back pain. Uh, I don't know if Dr. Wagner has had any other experience, but um, uh, that is not something we would routinely recommend. Yeah, I I would agree. Um, you know, there probably I don't think there's much literature that would you know give an evidence based guide for that. There's so many things that can cause back pain. I would want to be sure to rule out any other potential cause before I'd recommend that as the the one solution. Um, but that being said, I have seen some patients who have had the procedure and they say their back pain feels better. So it probably does work for some people. That makes sense. All right, so uh, here's a question. Um, how long does it take annular tears to heal? And once healed, are those areas susceptible to tear again? Field that one. Um, well, I guess I can start us off. Um, I, you know, I don't know that you know, we, we think of annular tears as just weakening of the outer layer of the disc. So um, it's kind of like having uh, a pair of tennis shoes that have just been scuffed or worn down. So um, as far as it healing, oftentimes patients can be totally asymptomatic and have an annular tear still um, shown on an MRI. So as far as if they do tear, um, the, the answer is they heal to a degree um, but it's not like a paper cut or uh, a slice on your finger that just heals up and goes away completely. Uh, usually an annular tear is a result of degenerative changes. Uh, then we kind of see that on an MRI. But maybe one of the physiatrists can enlighten us as far as uh, what their experiences have been. Yeah. I would agree with what Dr. Kwan said. Um, you know, it depends when you ask that question what you're thinking of. If, if your idea is uh, by looking at an MRI, does the does the degeneration changes, and that includes the annular tear, does that change on a, on a, a future MRI? And it usually doesn't. Um, it's just really kind of a reflection that there are some degenerative changes uh, in a disc. Um, the, the disc really, once it degenerates, and that includes annular tears, uh, doesn't really tend to heal itself real well, partly because there's not a great blood supply to the disc. Um, now, that doesn't always mean that pain that might be coming from a disc or what we call discogenic will always be there. Um, but on an MRI, um, usually once you have those changes, they persist. And again, I think the way that I tell patients is, you know, again, if you uh, have a cut on your arm and it heals up, um, and obviously it hurts when you have the initial injury, you know, five years down the road, you look down and you have a scar, that scar is there, but it's not painful. Um, so just because you can see an annular tear on an MRI, whether it's uh, initially or years down the road, you know, that doesn't always equate to pain. 
Um, it's helpful to know that some things that might sound alarming to us lay people actually aren't necessarily a serious issue. Um, I have another interesting question that came in. Uh, it says, there's a lot of back pain associated with pregnancy. Is it possible to see long-term damage to the spine from pregnancy? And if so, what solutions are recommended? Um, I would say really it's the same as uh, any other patient, whether they're pregnant or not. Uh, we generally try therapy, some supportive measures. Uh, you know, we've recommended certain, you know, pillows for sleeping for patients who have, uh, especially in the last trimester of pregnancy, uh, my wife being one of them. So uh, it's one of those things where um, I think we're limited as far as things that we can do, such as certain types of imaging, certain types of injections, uh, but in general, we'll kind of err on the side of uh, being maximal in our conservative therapy. Um, but really, we kind of um, will treat pregnant patients very similar to our uh, non-pregnant patients. All right. Thank you for that answer. Um, another question here. What is a laminectomy? I hope I've said that right. What is a laminectomy, and what are the potential side effects? That's a very good question. And so, you know, a, a laminectomy, the, the lamina is the part of the spine that is um, above the spinal cord closest to your, the skin on your back. Um, so when you go in from the outside, you have the spine has processed the lamina, and then you see the spinal cord. So it's the easiest part of the spine that we have to access to try and take pressure off of the nerves. And so there are many different techniques to do a, a laminectomy, but in general, when there's compression of a nerve, you go in and take that bone out to take the pressure off. And, and um, I think to piggyback off the exceptional video that Dr. Kwan did, you know, they talked about, he talked about there are three reasons um, that we do spine surgery, to decompress a nerve, to address instability, and then for deformity. And so when you do a laminectomy, you have to keep in mind those other two things. Um, we have, you have to make sure there's no instability. So we use x-rays to do that. And you have to make sure there's no deformity because, um, if you do a laminectomy in those settings, it can certainly change the stability of the spine. Um, so, but if you have just isolated nerve compression without any deformity or without any, any stability, a laminectomy can do very well. And it's also technique dependent. You have to be careful when you're doing the surgery to not take too much bone that could potentially destabilize the spine too. But when done correctly, it's an extremely inter effective intervention. Yeah, I think all those points are great points. I mean, the goal is to unpinch the nerves, but, uh, and as Dr. Wagner alluded to, it's kind of like a game of Jenga. You know, you take away too much and everything kind of falls apart. So, uh, you know, there certainly is a, an, an art to it, but uh, the goal is essentially to unpinch the nerve. Wonderful, thank you. Um, I have one question left, so send in your questions. It's the spinal countdown, so get them submitted. <laughs> Um, this one is a surgical question. Uh, when is surgery the right, the right option to treat scoliosis? I think I could talk from a, uh, from a pediatric and adolescent standpoint. For us, the indications to consider surgical intervention is when the curve progresses. Uh, it's about 45 to 50 degrees. That's when we start having the talk that there are risks that this uh, curvature and deformity will continue to progress into adulthood. And so that's when we start discussing surgery. There's not an exact number or degree of spinal deformity where you have to have things done. And that's what I tell patients is, you know, it's not uh, like an appendicitis or a heart attack where you have gotta go to the hospital and get this fixed if you have this issue. So we have time to prepare but typically that 45, 50 degree range, if they've tried bracing and it's progressed and they've tried physical therapy and they're still having pain and their curves getting progressively bigger, once it starts getting in this 45, 50 degree range, we start having surgical discussions on uh, what it entails, risks versus benefits, uh, that such. And that's, that's from the, for you know, pediatric adolescent uh, scoliosis. 
Yeah, so once they kind of leave Dr. Pulaski's office, uh, 10 years down the road, they'll often, you know, see someone like myself or Dr. Wegner. And uh, just because you have curvature in your spine doesn't mean you have to have screws and rods to fix it. So uh, in the adult population, the scoliosis is often associated with other conditions such as spinal stenosis, uh, instability of the spine. And so for us, it's mostly pain and dysfunction. Uh, we often will see that as curves progress, it's associated with increasing symptoms, uh, inability to stand up straight, pain that goes down the legs when patients are standing or walking, uh, even uh, to the point of having nerve deficits. So um, I think as far as uh, our surgeries go for spinal deformity, um, it's more the pain dysfunction versus purely uh, a number or a degree of curvature. Um, I know I have plenty of patients who have you know, 50, 60 degree curves that uh, are very functional and have minimal pain. And these are patients that I'll see uh, yearly or every year. And if there is progression, we may consider it. Um, but as long as they're active and can do the things that they want to do, uh, we generally discourage surgery. I think I'll, I'll piggyback off what both Dr. Pulaski and Dr. Kwan said in that, you know, the time to do a deformity surgery for me is when the patient tells me it's time to do the surgery. I don't ever pressure a patient into doing the surgery. Um, they basically have to be symptomatic enough that they're under, willing to undergo quite a big hit to, um, to fix that pain. And, and even, even in kids, I think it's a little bit more numbers-based, but still they have to be ready for the surgery because it, it is a, a, a big psychological and physiologic hit that they have to be ready to deal with. Understood. Thank you for that, uh, all of that insight. Here's another question that just came in about injections. Uh, the question is, what are the long-term effects of pain injections? Could a patient have injections done periodically over a decade or more? You could. The, the one that you're looking out for is things like osteoporosis, just long-term use of steroid. Um, you could, as long as you're spreading out the injections, um, you could do it over a period of 10 years. You wouldn't want to be doing it all the time during that period. If you're getting good relief for a period of time and it's improved your quality of life to the point you're happy where you're at, you've avoided surgery, that sort of thing. Um, yeah, you could do injections on and off for as long as, as long as you have to. So I would say that that is a question we get um, frequently. Most patients uh, are familiar with, um, a lot of them are familiar, familiar with steroid side effects, including uh, that it can promote osteoporosis. And what I usually tell patients in that situation when they're worried about that is, you know, let them know that yes, um, there are some bad side effects with, with steroid injections. Uh, most of the time, the side effects, the significant side effects are really related to people who are taking high dose of oral uh, steroids like prednisone for uh, regular on a regular basis for other conditions such as rheumatoid arthritis, uh, lung disease such as COPD, lupus, that kind of thing. Um, you know, I'm not entirely convinced I've I've seen anybody that has had significant osteoporosis from getting an intermittent injection. Yeah. I'd actually like to address something that's sort of the converse of that question, which I see a lot in my surgical practice is people say, I don't want injections at all. It's sort of the opposite of that. They say, I don't want a Band-Aid. And sort of Dr. Chasnus discussed that in his video. Um, but the analogy that I usually use is that, well, if you, if you sprained your ankle and you take ibuprofen for a while and then get better, was that ibuprofen a Band-Aid? Or did it fix you? I mean, you kind of let, have to let your body heal. And so I think injections can be the same. There's an there's a inflammatory component to the pain that's being treated by the injection. And if that gets you through the initial insult and inflammation, then you can avoid a surgery. So I think it's, it's, it's worth trying that injection. And then if you need to do that every year, I think that's still worth it rather than undergoing a surgery that could potentially have other complications. Yeah, I'd agree. And, and Injections can be helpful for things like disc herniations too. People think if you have a disc herniation, you're always stuck with that disc herniation. Unnecessarily true. There's about an 80% chance or so the body could take care of that on its own. Injections are just kind of a means to, like Dr. Wagner was saying, to get the pain under control enough that you can buy people time for maybe their body to take care of it and you might be able to avoid a surgery. Certainly. So it potentially sounds worth considering. 
Um, a few of you mentioned in some of your answers spinal instability. And what does that look like or feel like, or what is spinal instability? Yeah, that's uh, you know a, a good question. So you know, surgeons um, we talk about the concept of instability, uh, and it can mean a, a couple of things. But you know, we think of the you know spinal column where the spine is as kind of a, a house, and you know, essentially, if there's kind of a shift in the foundation, it can cause problems uh, throughout. So probably the most common spinal deformity we see is spondylolisthesis. And that's just kind of the, the $5 word for two bones shifting out of place. Um, so, you know, normally the, the bones and discs are arranged in a certain fashion that uh, they're right on top of one another. Um, and using kind of another analogy, you know, the blocks that kids play with, if you put one right on top of one another, it tends to be very stable. Uh, and you kind of push one off to the side and it tends to be unstable. So, uh, you know, patients can experience uh, back pain related to activity. Uh, the muscles have to work a lot harder to support the spine. Uh, and the other part is that the nerves kind of are right there where the bones are. So if the bones are shifting out of place, then you can get nerve issues such as nerve pain or numbness that go down the legs. Um, but as far as when we talk about instability, uh, again, the bones shifting out of place are probably the most common example of instability, other ones such as scoliosis and so forth that progress and get worse uh, represent a more bigger kind of global instability. Uh, but those would be the two kind of main categories. Great, thank you. Okay, here's a question uh, from a listener who is saying, I've had a microdisectomy on L5-S1 and now my L4, L5 is going down the same path. Other than strengthening the core, are there any other preventative measures to take to avoid spine surgery? You know, I think it depends on what the symptoms are. So uh, if someone is having um, mostly just back pain, uh, then I think it'd be all the things that we've kind of talked about tonight, uh, weight control, uh, physical fitness, physical therapy, core conditioning, uh, activity modification, uh, those types of things. Um, if someone's developing nerve pain uh, and symptoms similar to what you might have had before your L5-S1 microdiscectomy, then uh, that's kind of a different condition. Um, so it really, I think, depends on what symptoms a patient is experiencing. Um, just because you have some disc degeneration doesn't automatically mean that it's painful. Uh, in fact, we've done some studies looking at totally asymptomatic patients, uh, and we've done MRIs on them, and about 30 to 40 percent had degenerated discs or disc bulging with zero pain. So um, just because there is some degeneration doesn't automatically mean uh, more surgery and more pain. Wonderful. I hope that was helpful to the person who asked the question. Um, I have another question from a person who works standing up a lot in the medical field, and they have a lot of lower back pain that makes movement difficult. Um, so if their job can't allow them to sit down or stop standing a lot, what are their options to manage their pain? So. A lot of the times when we're, we're making a recommendation for treatment, it kind of relies on our ability to see if we can identify exactly, you know, where that pain generator is coming from. And to be truthful, and many times with back pain, it's multifactorial or hard to isolate to a specific cause. Um, you know, that person right there, it's hard to know exactly what the cause of their back pain is um, without kind of examining them and, and, and getting some imaging. Um, I do frequently tell people who are on their feet a lot and uh, who have to walk a lot to invest in a good pair of shoes and have a good cushioned sole. I think that might help a little bit, but uh, to uh, otherwise pinpoint uh, a specific treatment, I, I think I'd like to have a better idea of what might be causing the pain. All right. Well, I think I'm going to go rogue here and ask a question of my own. What do you think, Rachel? Should I? Do you have the nerve? Oh, very good. All right, to our esteemed panelists, here's my question. I have infamously bad posture. 
Uh, and in fact, a friend of mine actually gave me one of these devices recently that I think I'm supposed to place it on my back, and I don't know what it does. I, does it sh I think it's going to shock me every time it catches me slouching. Mm -hmm. uh, but I guess my question is, what is the role of posture in creating longer-term back issues that may need uh, you know, uh, to be addressed either conservatively or with surgery down the road? Yeah, I think we get that question asked, you know, a lot. Um, you know, sometimes it's kind of the chicken or the egg. So is it pain that's causing someone's posture to be poor or is posture, you know, causing some of these spinal problems? So, uh, you know, we do know that in elderly patients, uh, they'll often kind of stoop over, uh, you know, we kind of call it the shopping cart sign where they can, uh, you know, if they're in a grocery store and they have a little shopping cart, they can run around because they're bent over and hunched forward. Uh, and that relieves some of the uh, nerve, nerve pain that they have. Um, and so that might be, again, a posture problem related to uh, an underlying painful condition. But as far as, you know, does slouching as a teenager cause problems down the road? Uh, I don't know, uh, Dr. Pulaski, if you can answer that, but um, I don't know that I have a great answer as a deformity surgeon. Yeah, we, I get that question a lot, uh, uh, Dr. Corn, about the posture, especially as these kids are going through puberty and adolescence, their body is changing so rapidly over a short period of time, especially females with breast development. And, uh, and I agree with you say, is it the, the posture that causes the pain or vice versa? Uh, or just even without, uh, some kids have uh, poor posture even without pain. And, uh, and certainly uh, there is a component to posture that's structural, that is the way your spine is, is made and stacked, where your vertebrae are stacked. There is part that is muscular uh, that can be worked on, it can be improved. And I think uh, a good posture and good uh, sagittal balance uh, can be important with uh, how it uh, plays in with your uh, your overall muscle balance and could help prevent uh, back pain. But, uh, you know, as as kids get through puberty, uh, get out of adolescence, uh, you know, get rid of those 50-pound book bags that they're carrying at school, you know, get out of a desk that they're in for eight hours or hunched over their computer for eight hours uh, a day that uh, their posture does, that does tend to improve. And, and, uh, and not all bad posture equals a lot of pain. So I think you're safe. <laughs> Good. Maybe I'll hold off on uh, strapping on the, sh the shocking device. Who knows? Uh, well, first of all, we've got, we had 25 questions submitted. So thank you to everyone that submitted questions. And many, many thanks to our esteemed panel for sharing their wisdom and insight. And thank you for tuning in to this episode of Orthopedic Anatomy Series, Exploring Your Body from the Inside Out, presented by Ortho Carolina in partnership with Experience Anatomy. Well, we were glad to have you here today. And if you would like to learn more about what Experience Anatomy does, you can find us online at experienceanatomy.com. Rachel, I don't know about you, but I'm feeling a little taller after that. You? Definitely. Yeah, for sure. Mm. Thanks, everyone. And thanks to our panel.